The Little Sister of Eternal Devotion by Stephen Sinclair. The de Quarterlies were finished. Extinct, it had been a long run. From the first barbarian raiders who had shouted Odin and left a wake of terror and destruction, to the colonial governors who ruled with a quieter, more restrained terror to the last old lady. An old lady who had been constantly afraid the people she called Irish travellers would break into the house. She had almost been as fearful about this as some of the long-dead peasants had been of her own ancestors. The old lady had been a constant problem for social services because she didn't fit any of the patterns covered in their modules. The carers who went round towards the end had mostly been Eastern Europeans and they had disliked her with an instinctive dislike they wisely didn't try to analyse but they had still been kind to her. The de Quarterlies had been taxed out, and now they had died out. The long run had lasted for slightly over eight and a half centuries. Many countries don't manage even half that. The roof was also starting to go, on Great Quarterly Hall, their ancient numberless roomed mouldering ancestral pile. So the council and the creditors had stepped in, and to cut a long story blessedly short, it was going to be turned into a hotel. There was a lot of talk about it, being a good thing that the historic building would be preserved, and how it would also be a good thing for the local economy. It would of course do virtually nothing for the local economy, whilst making a few people very rich. Also enabling other people to get up to mischief in the rooms, and make the house a sad travesty of what it once was. But that was just life. There had been one unusual legal tangle. Various articles and clauses stipulated that a not very good, but very large landscape painting of the house's garden and the hills behind it be left in situ in the Great Hall. They were very clear about this. Probably it had been painted in the Elizabethan period by an unknown uncelebrated, not to mention not very talented, local artist. Said artist had also stuck a church in the picture. Although a church didn't and never had been part of the view, it turned out there was no way to get rid of this daub, although the lawyers tried. So it was decided to get the picture restored. It would be done on site to save money. Besides, the new owners reasoned, because it's old the Yanks will love it. This was why Avrilyn and her mum and dad were living there. In a few rooms next to the kitchen, her dad was the caretaker. It saved someone money, somehow for him to live on site. Avrilyn was vague on the details. She was often vague about stuff. It also made sense for her and her mum to be with him because her mum had kind of forgotten to pay the rent. And they were kind of between places. Again, none of the actual work on the house had started yet. Avalyn, who was 18, was home from college for the summer and she was a bit pleased about this in a distant, abstracted way. Some of the builders would have whistled and shouted things at her and asked her out. This would have been a bit tiring. The big fat posh art restorer bloke was there though. The big fat posh art restorer had got her dad the job. Having been associated with him before, he was working on his own on the picture, now that his assistants had helped him take it down from the wall. It lay in the middle of the floor of the great hall on plastic sheeting. The big fat posh art restorer had a machine that let him raise it up at an angle so he could work on it. And the picture was the thing. The thing that was going to get them everything get her everything she'd ever wanted. But it wasn't that picture, not the stupid landscape. It was the painting the restorer had discovered underneath that one. Avalyn was a very pretty girl with dark hair like her mother's. Probably cavemen drew hourglass shapes in the air before hourglasses were even invented to describe certain girls. That was her. She was also a very lazy girl who lazily wanted everything around her to be nice. She liked objects jewellery, shoes and clothes, but she had the perspicacity to understand why, when you had stuff that was it. It sat there and you didn't have to do anything. This was why she especially liked gold and diamonds, they lasted, and you didn't have to do anything. Not that she had lots of those nice things, she didn't. She had never been horrible to anyone at school or anything. Apart from anything else it took too much energy, sometimes she could be very kind, in a lazy kind of way. Boys gave her lots of attention, but it was a bit tiring. The entire female friends thing, a bit tiring. She posted videos of herself trying on undies on YouTube and did the OnlyFans thing, 
but she wasn't very good at it. It was a lot of work. Avalyn wasn't stupid, although her dad sometimes rolled his eyes at all the questions she gave funny answers to when she watched quiz shows on telly. She had a lot of insight, knew she would have been just the same if she'd been a boy, knew she wasn't going to get what she wanted from life and knew it would be the fault of her essential nature. Her tiny little waist would start catching up with her big chest and bum. Everything would start to sag. Because she was so lazy and lacking in self-discipline, she wouldn't be able to stop it. It had happened to her mum. And unlike her, Evelyn probably wasn't going to be as lucky as she'd been with Evelyn's dad. He might look like a caricature of an East End hard man, but there wasn't a day he didn't give his wife a kiss and a cuddle and forgive all the stuff she made a mess of. Or couldn't be bothered to do. Evelyn would settle for someone who got her lots of the things she wanted. This was odds on, probably, and he would knock her about and then dump her. Avalyn knew that if she'd voiced this to certain other females, they would have responded with talk about girl power and something called feminism. Just as she also knew it had nothing to do with stuff like that. It probably should have got her down more, but she lacked the character for sustaining deep depression. Then it happened. The big fat posh art restorer man was wide in more ways than one. And some of the stuff that was a bit illegal had been done with the help of Avalyn's dad, who the art restorer was also a bit scared of, which was in his little girl's opinion silly. The man had discovered something. Under a special light thing shone onto the back of the canvas vague shapes, figures, lines, and if that wasn't strange and interesting enough, the original image was inverted. The entire painting had been deliberately turned upside down before it was painted over. And then the restorer had spotted some letters. They spelled out, faintly but clearly, Hans Holbein. This was what they were going to do. The restorer went to Big Frank. Avalyn's dad, he would make a copy of the original rubbish landscape. He could do this very easily, and he would then use his contacts to fence the Holbein. There were big Arab, Russian and American collectors who would pay virtually anything for it. Big Frank would provide some muscular protection plus making sure he had peace and quiet to work. That was if it was genuine, and if the original Renaissance masterpiece was in good enough condition. He couldn't be 100%, but he didn't think it would be a problem, and they would split the take 50-50. It was beautiful, and here was the thing. No one was going to lose out. The restorer had pointed out how weird it was, though. They had some strange ideas in those days. I'm not sure yet but I think the standing figure's a man. Someone really didn't like him very much, Frank. Not only inverted so he's facing the bad old fire and then covered over, and I think whoever had it done deliberately painted that church over his head. Must admit, it gives me a touch of the old judders. Gives me pause, shall we say. But all our lovely soon-to-be money consoles me. Her dad explained the situation to her and her mum. It was easier if they knew what was going on. The layout of the place would have made it difficult to keep them out of it anyway. His girls simply had to make sure they didn't say anything. Besides, he enjoyed telling them about all the soon-to-be money. In the Great Hall of Great Quarterly Manor, the original painting unseen for centuries began to emerge. The main feature of the restorer's personality was greed. Always had been. He passed through life in a miasma of it. A lust of wanting that was so great, it had turned into a twisted sort of generosity. He was so greedy, it wasn't enough that he got what he wanted. Everybody around him must as well. The hotel owners must get the restored, not very good landscape and be happily none the wiser. The buyer of the old master would get to look at all the pictures he was taking of the location, the restoration process and other info, and be made a very content, happy about provenance, billionaire collector of illegally stolen and or unlawfully undeclared priceless art. Big Frank and his family must become very rich, rough as a badger's proverbial, but good sports people. Finally, he himself must of course become filthy rich. The restorer was very fond of Avalyn. He had no ulterior motives, whilst aware of the effect she would have had on him as a young man, a bit like the effect a sweet shop would also have had on the long-gone greedy little boy he had been. He also knew he would have always been nice to her, 
would have greasily wanted her to be happy. And he would have been sincere. This, of course, kind of selfishness because it was what he preferred. Big Frank's presence or absence would have been genuinely irrelevant. In any case, he was now in his late sixties, old enough to be a bit mistily sentimental about her. He found himself talking to her about what he was doing. Soon he had the fake not very valuable or good landscape convincingly forged. Big Frank stored it away in something plebeian sounding called the lockup. He explained he'd decided to frame the figures. There seemed to be two, one standing, one seated. He did this by revealing parts of the background first. It turned out to be the view from the long gallery of this very house. The diamond paned windows became visible behind the figures. You could make out the same line of hills you saw from there now, minus the modern pylons. Avalyn seemed to be interested in some of this in a lackadaisical way. The thought of the money was becoming less abstract to her and her parents. Finally, he had nearly all the seated figure uncovered and the artist's signature. The painting that was going to get her everything she wanted was real. The big fat posh restorer had called her and her mum and dad and shown them. He had grabbed her and given her a big hug. She didn't mind, had hugged him back. Her female radar told her it wasn't that kind of hug. Anyway, she kind of liked him. Her mum had squealed with delight, clapped her hands with glee under her wobbling chins. The big fat posh restorer had given her mum a big hug. Then he gave her dad a hug. Her dad had shouted out a good on you mate and clapped him on the back. The big fat posh restorer had been teary eyed. He said, there's no doubt, it's by Holbein of Rotterdam. The woman in the painting was very beautiful. She was seated on an ornate chair, almost a throne. Facing the viewer directly, she had a long pale face framed by long darkly auburn hair. Something that looked to Avil in a little like a small crown was on her head. The woman looked a bit like that actress on the film about the archaeologist girl from the video game. Or like an English version of that old Mexican bird who'd been in the film about gangsters and vampires. The one Dad had a bit of a thing for. Her elaborate, richly decorated dress looked to Avalyn like something one of the cartoon princesses she'd liked when she was a little girl would have worn. Avalyn thought the woman in the painting would have done well online if she'd been alive today. But there was something a bit disturbing about her. There definitely was. It wasn't just that the painting was so old and therefore automatically weird. For a start, there was the fancy little table of shiny black wood on the woman's left. The artist had been so skilled, the wood so dark, that he had kind of shown reflections on it. There was a skull sitting there, and the woman's left hand rested lightly on its crown. Her index finger was ever so subtly curled down into one empty socket. It was a human skull, but it was also a bit like a monkey's skull. Or something, like something from the biology lessons Avalyn had never paid attention to. And then there was the women's face. She reminded her a bit of a girl she'd been in school with. Said girl had gotten into heavy drugs, synthetics and stuff. And they had all known that something was off with her before knowing what it was. And they hadn't known how they knew. The girl in question had apparently gone on to be a member of what her mum had once referred to as the world's oldest profession. The woman in the painting was a bit like that, but not exactly. She was beautiful but somehow her face still conveyed something that wasn't just a bit weird, but in fact downright horrible. Her lips were curved up into a subtle little smile. She had feminine little dimples. The lines at the side of her mouth were perhaps a little too deep. It was a, as if the geography of that face spelled out secrets. And if you'd been unlucky, she'd have told you what some of them were. It didn't help that face radiated effortless confidence and self-assurance. The eyes were a startling icy blue. The woman's right hand lay on the bent arm of the male figure who was standing beside her. The only part of this figure yet visible, the complexity of the impression the woman's image gave her tired Avalyn's head and scared her. Beside her, the restorer was talking to her dad and she half listened. We've been lucky, Frank, very lucky. Entire thing covered over with a kind of non-caustic wash. Bless its non-acidic early modern heart. Then paint applied to that. 
never seen anything like it, although parts are still very tricky. Her dad had asked, I don't get how they didn't just get rid of them too, however they were. The restorer answered, as I said before, funny ideas, pictures sort of capture things. I think they wanted them to stay where they were. I think they thought destroying that, he pointed at the picture, would have let them out. Anyway, lucky old us. And here, he pointed to some fancy gold letters besides the woman's feet. They looked like a kind of pop-up to Avalyn. We know who she was. The restorer carefully read Lady Margaret, wife of Francis, 12th Lord of de Quarterly, daughter of William de la Poor, 9th Baron Exam. And when he read this out, Avalyn's mum had made a noise. It was a sad, bleating little gasp, and her mother's face had turned the colour of white cheese, the only cheese Avalyn liked. She thought anything else was nasty, and swayed on her feet. Her husband put his arm round her and asked, You all right, love? And she'd muttered something and left the room. Avalyn looked after her and then back at the picture. She was fascinated by it, finding that she was particularly keen to see what the man would look like. Somehow she couldn't tear her eyes away from that already partially uncovered arm. The next day, her mother announced that she got a call from her dad. Avalyn's nan was, she said, very unwell, and she was going to see her. Avalyn's mother was originally from a place called Anchester, which was even more boring and out the way than this place. Avalyn's mother went off and never saw her husband or daughter ever again. A very short time later and he was uncovered. She had watched. At first, she had expected to lose interest and get bored. At one point, she had been afraid it would happen and she wouldn't be able to stop it. That her nature, so like her mother's who she knew without knowing or having to ask, had run away would take her interest in him away. But it didn't. And the boy in the picture was always with her now. Before uncovering his face, the restorer told her his name. He had been called Lord Henry de Quarterly. 13th Lord of Quarterly, Knight of the Order of the Star, Holder of the Order of the Golden Fleece, Defender of the Northwest Marches, etc. Her dad had already asked. The man, the woman's husband or sister then? The restorer didn't think so, said a lot of stuff about how the woman would have been standing beside him and things. He told them it was far more likely that she was his mother. Evelyn still found she wanted to reach into the picture and knock the women's arm off the boy's arm. Probably she was painted as she looked when she was younger. Avalyn had, inside her head, furiously agreed. There he stood, tall and well-built, facing the viewer directly like the woman, legs confidently apart, one foot slightly before the other, one arm bent, fisted hand on his waist, the other resting on the basket handle of his sword. The sword had elicited the restorer's delight, he said the basket handle depicted had probably been made up north of the border, in Falkirk or Stirling. Blade likely from the Low Countries and originally a cavalry weapon, the de Quarterlies had apparently been related in some way to the MacGregors, a gift from cousins perhaps. The blade was shown deliberately slightly drawn from its sheath. Interesting touch that. Our boy wanted people to know he was handy with that. That's a claymore, bloody thing would have had you in half. The red hose he wore should have been ridiculous, but wasn't. Avalyn didn't think he had ever been ridiculous. Lord Quarterly was resplendent, in a shirt and doublet of purest black threaded with an incredibly complex patter of gold and silver thread. But it was of course his face and eyes that held her transfixed. The face framed by long hair, the same colour as his mother's, looked like a masculine version of that parent's. He had a neatly trimmed growth of beard on his chin. Avalyn was simultaneously reminded of the bad boys she'd been in school with, the ones the girls all liked. Also, the heroes on the covers of those books her mum liked. Books that she thought of as being the old lady equivalent of the only fan stuff. Books with silly titles like Love Storm and Never Love a Pirate. He also looked a bit like that king they were always making the films about. The one with all the wives. His eyes had also been the same ice blue as his mother's. The face radiated power and other things. The wide only just not sneering mouth seemed to promise things. At once wonderful and terrible, 
When Avalyn gazed into that face, she found herself playing with her hair. There were butterflies in her stomach. She had to resist the temptation to look at him, with her face turned slightly down one shoulder. When she walked away from the painting, she thought she could feel his eyes on her. It made her hips swing too much. She found herself going into the Great Hall at night and starring transfixed at the painting. She would lose all track of time, and she began to dream. But not of him. She dreamed that the woman in the painting came to her. The woman indeed was the boy's mother. There were two dreams. Both were terrible. The woman would tell her things. The Eulatide seven months before he was born, I spent at my father's. We hosted a stupid reformer at the priory. Him and his wife, although with the old king, still on the throne, married clergy for the cursed sheep god was still penal. One of my brothers had met them in London. The fools had their child with them. We served them long pork, and then father showed them the real cut of the beast. He told them there was no debate about the transubstantiation in our communion. Perhaps one of your mother's people served at that table. In one way or another, when we dragged them below, the mother was screaming. The cattle were lowing. The baby awoke. So my father he. I felt my own child's joy. Avalyn had woken screaming. The other dream was even worse. I see you admire my boy's face. Although it is long gone. Never mind, sweet child. The skull beneath the vanished flesh and skin still wanders in the darkness through woods and fields not so far from here, in the night. The rain and wind still lash the bones. He is lonely, but not alone. Perhaps he would find your society most pleasing, although I doubt you'd now find his soul. An Avalyn would see something with glowing green eyes and wake screaming. She had looking at him for consolation. She wasn't stupid. She knew this was both strange and ridiculous, and she also knew something else. Soon something wonderful was going to happen. Avalyn was able to reassure her dad that she was just having nightmares. She used the women things card and he let it go. She'd always been able to wrap him round her little finger. He in turn reassured himself with the knowledge that they would soon be rich and far away the creepy old house. Finally, she went into the great hall early one evening and there besides one of his feet, there lay a book, a book that hadn't been there before. So she went up to the long gallery and got it. But if anyone else had looked at the painting, they wouldn't have seen any book. It was for her. This is some of what she read. Only a little. No, novice of the little sisters of eternal devotion, that there stands on the island called Sorrow, a great statue. Across the waters, once stood the city called New York. But New York stands there no more. Instead, there rears the good black towers of one of our nunneries. The statue is Our Lady of Sorrows. She sorrows because of the great rebellion against our Lord. To interpret her in any other way is a besent to the stone pen sin. Now recite some of his many names. Do this for three hours on your knees. Say your beads, he who needs not our blessings, King Emperor of Mankind, Immortal Caesar, the Great Beast, Avalyn's Mind World. There were so many things she didn't understand. What did Great Con mean? What did it mean by Tsar of Muscovy? The list of titles went on for pages. She read them all. No novice of the little sisters of eternal devotion, that off the main landmass of the empire, there stands the palace island and its secondary parts. From here the world is ruled. To its west is the island called Breadbasket. To its north, the hunting lodge. Know also that palace was once called respectively England, Ireland and Scotland. These names you must never utter. This is a sin of damnation. This is the command of he who must be obeyed. On your knees say the Dark Lord's name 100 times, for in the great betrayal before it was utterly crushed. Praise be, the people here and in the Americas betrayed him who needs not our blessing. Also in other places, agony be upon them. She read much more. The restorer found her. She had killed her father with a big kitchen knife and then splashed his blood all over the painting. Lord Henry de Quarterly's face had been cut from the canvas. She was knelt before the mutilated painting, alternately kissing the picture of his face and smashing it against her forehead. She looked up at him and grinned. 
It was the grin he remembered as he went about the task of drinking it and himself away. My life for him, she said. The little sister of eternal devotion said her hours. She went on saying them in the place they locked her up in. Avalyn wasn't lazy anymore. Avalyn's descent into the cult's madness has reached its chilling climax. But the unholy horrors don't stop here. Click to watch Wandering Oscar, the most successful work from Stephen Sinclair in the Tales from the Cryptkeeper channel, where the AI conjures up unspeakable terrors.